Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much indeed for joining us for this Funkachul Art Platform Symposium. You would now like to introduce the participants. Please turn on your cameras. From the United States, we're going to be welcoming Ray Kotomi, art historian and associate professor of the University of California, Los Angeles, William Marotti. We will be having a discussion with the participants of the Translation Project Selection Committee. And we're going to be joined by Oda Denatsuko the of the Yoshiko Ishiki office, and Nakajima Izumi of Osaka University, and also Yamamoto Hiroki of Kanazawa College of Art, and myself, Kajia Kenji of the University of Tokyo. We also will be joined by Okuborena and I, Kajia, will be Ayotkin as the moderator. So with no further ado, we would now like to begin this symposium entitled Translating Contemporary Japanese Art, Discourse, Context and History. First of all, we'd like to call upon Kataoka Mami, Chair of the Contemporary Art Committee Japan, to say a few words. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Kataoka Mami. In 2018, the Contemporary Art Committee Japan started up the art platform activity, which can be traced back to 2014 when the began a process of clarifying some of the issues and tasks that we had to confront as we looked at how to heighten awareness about contemporary art here in Japan. We also had a process where we where the understanding was that we needed to have a multi-pronged and multifaceted approach. So one of the issues that we identified was to have the sort of connection where we could actually visualize each other's faces, where we began to extend invitations for participants to come and to mingle. We also had a clarification about some of the issues that we needed to overcome uh, concerning communication. We also established a website. We looked at the collections which are held by public sector and also private museums to create a database which was provided in Japanese and English, so it was a bilingual database. And we also had a series of meetings which were organized around working groups where experts participated. And we have been seeing this process go on for about five years. Concerning the translation project, those of you who are participants know how time-consuming it is and how much expertise and professional knowledge is required. And we're very grateful to everybody for their participation and for their tremendous contribution. And we're very happy that we have the symposium today. Thank you, Kataoka-san. Uh, next, I would now like to call upon Natsuko Odate uh, to uh, discuss the textual translations uh, promoted by the Bunkacho Art Platform Project. Uh, she is a member of the Translation Project, and she's also a member of Contemporary Art Committee Japan, and also a member of Yoshiko Ishiki Office. And uh, she has, has been a pro uh, involved uh, in uh, various projects uh, which are run uh, by the Yoshiko Ishiki office. I call upon Ms. Odate uh, to continue. Thank you very much uh, for your uh, uh, translation. My name is Odate, and I am a member of the translation project. 
And as Ms. Hakatoka explained about the ad platform her business, uh, or her translation her project uh, is uh, trying uh, to be involved uh, in the interest of her translation, which will uh, promote her to the uh, advancing of the Japanese um, uh, contemporary art. So could you please advance the slides? Yes, uh, as to the background of this project, um, it is important uh, to understand the historical uh, historical and culture context uh, in uh, trying to uh, comprehend contemporary artwork. The project uh, will uh, translate research materials and necessary literature to help uh, with the understanding of uh, such a contemporary art. Uh, the pro issue is uh, that uh, the, the texts uh, which are written about uh, such uh, Japanese art are uh, very rarely read uh, by any researchers outside of uh, Japan. And it is true uh, that uh, there have been uh, various exhibitions uh, conducted in overseas uh, museums, uh, which has also uh, prepared uh, catalogs uh, for the occasion. Uh, but uh, we are uh, finding that uh, there is an uh, 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 reducing her number of uh, such exhibits uh, held uh, outside of Japan. Uh, to give a few of the uh, exhibits conducted in 1885, Reconstruction of Vanguard Art in Japan, or uh, at the Computer Center in 1986, Japan Hotel of Vanguard, and uh, there was another exhibit at the Guggenheim uh, Japanese Art after 1945, Scream Against the Sky. And so uh, these had been some exhibits examples of uh, exhibitions uh, which had uh, centered solely on uh, Japanese art. But since uh, such a number is uh, decreasing, uh, then there is not sufficient information in material uh, for researchers uh, to use uh, to uh, comprehend uh, the situation. Now, in 2012, uh, this was uh, published uh, by Museum Modern Art, From Postwar to Postmodern Art in Japan, 1945 to 1989. And uh, some of the members uh, here, such as uh, Mr. Kajia, had also been involved uh, in this uh, project. And this had been compiled uh, by Heito Yun Chong uh, from this exhibition. And uh, this uh, publication, as it's being introduced here, uh, this uh, is a, a collaboration uh, between the uh, researchers and also uh, editing uh, staff uh, from the Japanese side. And uh, we understand uh, that uh, at the MoMA, uh, there is a, a project uh, at MoMA uh, to handle uh, some international program to cover areas uh, such as uh, East and uh, Central uh, Europe, Argentina, Venezuela, China, Japan, Brazil, and uh, uh, Arabic nations, uh, where uh, they will uh, work with the, uh, will solicit the assistance of local researchers uh, to prepare and uh, publish and anthologies uh, from her MoMA. And uh, what we are doing is uh, to select uh, some uh, publication, including this publication, to see how we can uh, provide uh, translations uh, for the use of researchers. Uh, here are some of the uh, targets that we have set forth for ourselves. Uh, we do want to see an improvement in the quality of our translations. The issues that we can encounter here today are that uh, while uh, many of the catalogs prepared uh, by Japanese museums, they do have text written in uh, English or translations. However, uh, these texts are rarely uh, being uh, proofread or checked uh, by her native uh, speakers uh, so that the quality of the translation uh, might uh, vary. Uh, and uh, there are also uh, no uniformity in the method of uh, notification. Uh, noting her uh, some concepts of expressions. Uh, so in order to improve this, we did two things. And one was uh, to establish a system for uh, the translation work. And so this will go through the processes of translation, cross-checking, and proofreading. And as you can see, uh, there will be three people involved in this process. And uh, also uh, Ms. Andrew Marco, uh, who had been also a part of this uh, project, 
has prepared what we call a hairstyle guide. And you'll be able to see this on our website as to uh, what uh, this um, style guide and comp uh, includes, and it is a very useful uh, guide, uh, which uh, does uh, pertain uh, to how to proceed with the translation, uh, how some expressions have been used, and it is a very uh, helpful uh, guide uh, for anyone who is going to be involved in uh, translation of works. And so I would like to encourage you uh, to uh, look at this uh, from this uh, website. And uh, and when we are conducting these translations, we also try to select what is appropriate for this. Because Bunkacho is involved, the translations may be regarded as her canons, which I had harbored some concerns. And we also need to reflect the fact that there is a wide variety or diversity, and also many, many aspects in her view points on her various topics. In selecting her uh, uh, volumes, uh, we decided that there would also need to be selection of some women included in this. And so we have a way of uh, setting a, a quota uh, where we will ensure that, that there will be a representation of, of female writers as well. And we have also seen uh, how we will be able to uh, select uh, the researchers uh, for the Asian uh, art as well. Uh, reflecting the fact uh, that uh, there might be artwork uh, which is coming from uh, foreign uh, artists living here or uh, from colonies. And so uh, we'll try to uh, make sure that there will be an enough uh, explanation on some of the concepts that are used. And just for the actual selection, um, this is a book by a major term by Kurutaraiji, Nikutai Nanakism, which is about performance in the 1960s in, Japan, in the context of Japanese art. And there's also Bijis no Nihon Kinden Daishi, a selection of, and partial uh, translation of this, which was published in 2014, will be forthcoming in 2023 from the University of Leuven uh, University Press. And on a one by one basis, we have 10 themes, and we've been looking at the multiplicity, diversity, perspectives, as we look at book, published books, catalogues, newspapers, magazines, and also academic articles and web published media as the basic background from which we select texts. So I've just given you an overview of the past four years of involvement. We had a great deal of support and cooperation from many, many people. And we've also been supported magnificently by the Secretariat as we proceeded with translation. Whichever stage you look at, for example, getting approval or the sign-offs for the usage of images is very time consuming and it also is a very painstaking process. As for actual translated output, we have 28. Uh, finished translations, which are now available for you to be able to see uh, via the website. We also will be continuing to add to this um, translated output in PDF format on our website. And this slide shows you that we have dedicated a great deal of resources to this process. And we have built up quite a lot of know-how. And this is not just about the actual output of the translated text. We also have the great amount of experience and human capital regarding translators, cross-checkers, and also copy editors, guidelines, which has really been built up. And this is really an important asset, which is the outcome of this process, which we had not been able to share with many people up to now. But we also would like to share this in the future with researchers, scholars, artists, museums, and any other persons or organizations who are interested in this, and to be able to tap this in a very proactive way. And we also have Shuzo, 
which is a searchable database of the collections held by museums across Japan, which is also available to see on the Art Platform website, and we're thinking of linking up with the Shuzo site in the future. And on a personal note, personally, I would like to see, and I hope to be able to see, a greater ability to share the know-how that we have with art institutions abroad as well as within Japan and also scholars. Also, it might be difficult to have the three-pronged process of the know-how that we have built up with this methodology of translation uh, on a fee basis, but we hope that we're going to be able to provide the additional support that we can provide with this experience and the manpower, the human, uh, the human resources that we have. We also hope to be able to link up with the Museum Collections Database, Shuzo, and we hope perhaps to be able to have a real-time or close to real-time process of having an translation which is going to be generated in step in tandem with something which is an ongoing development and we also um, regarding um, thoughts and also attempts to analysis we also hope to be able to expand on the language possibilities aside from Japanese and English um, sharing knowledge really ties in with the theme of Documenta, which I was able to go to see this year. And it's really about sharing knowledge. And I hope that I could uh, see many of you participate so that we can further develop this possibility and this ability. And this is a final slide which just summarizes the number of people who were involved in the activity. More than 100 authors, uh, advisors who are for selection, 27. About 100 people who are involved in the actual process of the translation cross-checking. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Odatu-san. Uh, she has just has spoken about the project on translation and also her, what are some of the uh, prospects she has for the future. Thank you. Next, I'd like to call upon her, Reiko Hotomi, uh, to speak. And uh, she is a historian, and uh, she is uh, also a, uh, an organizer and co-director of the Poncho Genkon uh, list of her group of specialists. And he, she published a book called uh, The Radicalism in the Wilderness, International Contemporaneity and 1960s Art in Japan, for which she reserved and received the Robert uh, Motherwell Book Award. And uh, she has also received the Commissioner of of her Cultural Affairs Award in 2020. Uh, Ms. Tomi, please. Hello, I'm Reiko Tomi from New York. Uh, thank you for the invitation today. I'll be speaking on the theory of her trinity in post-war art history, how to secure a place for Japanese post-war her contemporary art in her world art history. I have been asked her to discuss the, her current status of contemporary Japanese art studies outside of Japan and the issues that they are facing. I have also been asked to offer some suggestions regarding the issues found on the Japanese side. I would first like to share an, an apprehension I am harboring. That is to say, I fear post-war Japanese art history is facing a critical moment. Uh, this is how I regard the issues. 1960s art in Japan has been recognized for its uh, prescient radical and international contemporaneity. Its place as a paradigmic uh, site of her world art history has been gradually acknowledged, yet this is her development has owed much to the fact that the immediate post-war years, Japanese art received much attention internationally. In other words, uh, the legacy of post-war art had been visualized as art history. However, the studies of post-war art in other non-Western areas on the presumed periphery have since developed 
and Japan has now become only one of the many voices heard. Now that the global contemporary art scene in the 21st century now witnesses a profusion of such art just in the Asian region, in Southeast and South Asian countries, as well as China and Korea in East Asia, so that the contemporary art scene in Japan in comparison may seem rather quiet. Against such a backdrop of global art scene, how is Japanese post-war and contemporary art positioned? What sort of studies should be pursued in the area of post-war Japanese art history or contemporary art? In order to break through this sense of crisis, I would like to first look back over about 30 years of studies within and outside of Japan and to see how they can connect her to the future. As a historian, I would like to see what can be learned from this history. If I am to do a retrospect of the past 30 years, I should first look at the advances of individual studies conducted. This is a major premise from which I start, and I should also stress that these studies are ongoing endeavors. In Japan, surveys and fundamental studies have continued at museums, and they are constantly being improved. I have seen the works of specialists and students at graduate school level have also expanded in scope. One should also note the advances in methodologies used for collection, digitalization, and research of archived material. Turning our eyes outside, it is true that there is also steady progress, though slowly, in the researches conducted by individual researchers and graduate school students, while the results may not be large in volume. What is of note outside of Japan is that uh, there are great advances made in studies beyond individual studies. In other words, uh, there are certain uh, results observed in the form of innovations at a macro level in the general framework of history. Firstly, here to an attempt to proactively gain recognition and to intervene in the area of world art history. And second, uh, to recognize and to affirm uh, that the uh, fact that 60 Japan had been a uh, paradigm site of uh, world uh, history. And thirdly, uh, to initiate uh, the theory of her uh, trinity. With regard to proactive intervention to world art history, an important example can be cited. A work by Ming Tianpo uh, titled Gutai, uh, Decentering Her Modernism. Gutai Shu and Karano Chosen, the Japanese title. Uh, what is important about this book is that it is not limited to specific individual studies. As a major theoretical framework, it has theorized a departure from the Eurocentrism by setting forth decentering. This work uh, is a multifaceted her pursuit of her strategies for rethinking the concrete, which until now has been regarded as a marginal presence of modernism. Ming Tianpo's work is also important in terms of establishing a network of cooperation on the individual level. In the Guggenheim Museum's major exhibit of Gutai was realized by combining the theoretical framework of decentering of world art history with the results of the individual studies of Gutai in Japan and abroad, including Tianpo himself. Uh, the recognition uh, that Japan in the 1960s uh, is a paradigm site in the history of world art is the theme that I asserted in my book, Radicalism in the Wilderness, International Contemporaneity and 1960s Art in Japan. Uh, this book has not uh, been published in Japanese yet. As individual uh, research, I describe the innovative uniqueness of Japanese art of the 1960s, focusing on Yutaka Matsuzawa, the play, and gun. As uh, for macro research, I took over Tempo's work and further theorized decentering, uh, presenting a methodology to describe world art history uh, from a periphery in a bottom-up manner, uh, starting uh, from individual cases. Basis. In particular, I theorize a methodological uh, framework uh, for uh, comparative art history based on the key concept of international uh, contemporaneity through the concept of resonance and connection. An example uh, of uh, macro is the theory of trinity. An example of this was seen in the first half of 2010s uh, when there had been a heightened rush of interest in the United States for post-war Japanese art. First, uh, let me explain the concept of the theory of uh, 
uh, Trinity. Uh, this is uh, my own way of thinking uh, that a Trinity is necessary for Japanese post-war art, including contemporary art, uh, to secure a place in the history of the uh, world art. First of all, uh, the work must be good. The question of what makes a good work itself may be a subject of debate, uh, but for the time being, the wow factor is a prerequisite. It needs to make some kind of impact. Without this, people will not be attracted to the work. However, this alone will not be enough. It will only be a temporary novelty. To go beyond that, the three essential prerequisites of academia, the market, and the museum must emerge. First of all, the wow factor. Uh, it is the first impression you get when you see something unfamiliar. Uh, this was a uh, frank and reaction of uh, foreign countries to works such as Atsuko Tanaka's spell in the mid-1950s or a guns event uh, to change the image of snow in 1970. So what will uh, take? What will it take to turn turn this reaction into a down-to-earth recognition rather than a passing surprise? Uh, first and foremost, we need academic studies. In other words, art history. What is this? Where did this come from? What does it mean? Art history of the research provides answers to such simple yet essential questions and generates historical value. This is the cultural function of academia. Uh, it is the market uh, which performs an economic function uh, that positions uh, culture as part of the economy in society. The market generates a monetary value uh, through commercial activity or exchange. For a work to be sold, uh, galleries and art consultants must also respond uh, to the simple but essential questions that collectors may ask, such as what is this? Uh, so it is important that there is interplay between the market and the academia, in particular uh, museums and collectors in Europe and the United States in the heart of the global marketplace will not loosen uh, their purse strings uh, simply by saying, oh, wow. And they will not uh, be convinced merely by words of impressionistic criticism. This is, uh, art history serves as an endorsement of cultural value and reference book for art dealers and others to explain works of art. However, this alone will not yet establish culture in society. In order to socialize culture, museums are needed to take on social functions. In postmodern society, uh, there may be resistance to defining the art museum as the final resting place of a piece of art. However, it is also true that museums occupy an important strategic position on the battlefield of her world art history. Of course, the role of the individual collectors must also be considered, but from the standpoint of the final resting place, the individual collector is in an intermediate position in the socialization process. One cannot ignore the existence of influential collectors in Europe and the United States who collect with the ultimate goal of donating their collections to museums. However, there is still a risk of artworks ending up as dead stock if they are simply stored in a museum. The collected works must be actively exhibited so that there is more exposure. The culture value of artworks must also be enhanced through education and awareness raising at universities universities, and in general public museums at the forefront. Uh, thus, uh, the creation of value is layered in the order of academia, the market, and the museum, and art takes root in history through this trinity. Of course, the trinity strategy also applies to contemporary art. However, in the case of Japanese post-war art, one of the reasons why the close cooperation of the trinity uh, was key was the fact that the number of works from the 1950s and 60s was small in absolute terms. Uh, the story goes, uh, uh, my theory of the Trinity was uh, based on my observation in the field. It goes back to Alexander Monroe's 1994 exhibition at the Guggenheim Museum, Japanese art after 1945 scream against the sky, or known simply as the scream. The contribution of the screen exhibition uh, to post-war Japanese art history is first and foremost that it presented a new wow factor to a wide audience. Uh, secondly, with academia at the center, uh, the project showed that post-war Japanese art was a unique and authentic modernism weaving global and local threads uh, that dispelled the trauma of the Western historical view uh, that peripheries are imitations. Uh, this was best 
demonstrated in the New York Times review of the exhibition, which acknowledged that Japanese contemporary art is not a watered-down version of Western modernism, and that many of the artists are pioneers, even compared to their counterparts in the West. And with regard to educational enlightenment, uh, the English language publication, uh, which more than doubled the size of the Japanese language exhibition catalog, resulted in the publication that functions as an easy-to-read textbook. However, one serious problem remained. Uh, that is, at that point, uh, there were virtually only the screen exhibition and its catalog, which provided any sort of information. Uh, uh, the pressing issue at the point where we need more academia, we need more markets, we need more museum collections. So these were the three issues. I would not have believed it myself had I not been there. But after the Scream exhibition, I was utterly surprised by an unexpected question. Where can I buy one of these works? Where can I buy one of these? Uh, in other words, the market was going to have to satisfy the interest uh, for the wow uh, that had been triggered by the collection. The Scream exhibition was a special exhibition, and most of the exhibited works were returned to the collections in Japan. In other words, the wow factor remained only as a memory in the U.S., and these great works did not acquire constant physical presence here. Impact is necessary, but by seeing the same work, and the same artists over and over again, the viewer's eyes become accustomed to the work, and this is an important aspect of an art uh, dissemination. In other words, none of the elements of the Trinity theory was there. After 1994, it took nearly 20 years or until the early 2010s uh, for each of the three elements of the Trinity to finally begin uh, to function. In response to the Scream exhibition, it was the academia which first began to be noticed after 1994. It was acknowledged that post-war Japanese art was a topic worthy of research at the graduate school level, and this led to gradual increase in the number of students in art history researchers. After 10 years or so in 2003, uh, there were quite a few academics uh, in this area. Uh, with Miwaka Tezuka, who was still a grad school student, I established uh, a mailing list group uh, called uh, Ponja Genkon uh, Net. Uh, the mailing list uh, is a virtual presence, but I was able to appeal uh, the physical existence of post-war Japanese art history through conferences and panels, uh, which I organized constantly uh, with the cooperation of Yale University and uh, Getty Research Institute. Uh, please refer uh, to uh, her website, uh, ponjahagenko.net. Another development since the Scream exhibition uh, was the emergence of a market. Uh, art dealers uh, who had growing interest began to search uh, for available pieces, and once enough numbers of works were identified, they began exhibiting them. One other thing uh, that was of importance uh, was that uh, these dealers collaborated with researchers to publish catalogs and to organize panel discussions, thereby taking part in building discourse. The path uh, to museum collection was thus prepared, but museums uh, run on tight budgets in any country, and particularly those in the West are especially cautious uh, about investing in new works of art uh, such as uh, contemporary Japanese art. In hindsight, uh, the exhibitions of contemporary Asian art that uh, Monroe organized at the Japan Society at the Guggenheim Museum New York uh, seem to have played an invisible role in promoting the link of the Trinity. In other words, uh, by increasing American museums' familiarity with Asia and uh, promoting research-based activities, uh, they laid the groundwork uh, for museum acquisitions. After these preparations, the Trinity became a phenomenon in the first half of the 2010s. Incidentally, uh, this slide uh, shows catalogs from the MoMA Tokyo exhibition in 2012, Gutai exhibition at the Guggenheim in 2013, and Motonaga and Shiragasa two-person exhibit uh, at the Dallas Museum in 2015, and her post-war Japanese photography at the Museum of Fine Arts, Houston, 2015. 
To summarize, uh, the Trinity uh, is a strategy to promote and establish post war and contemporary art in the world of art history and global discourse uh, through the close linkage of academia and art history, the market, and the museum uh, collections and exhibitions. Now, uh, based on these results, I would like to briefly summarize the challenges ahead. First, uh, the continuation of individual research and the uh, continuation of enhancement and expansion of uh, domestic and international collaborations are possible as an extension of the past. Uh, secondly, it is important to expand the macro historical perspective in world art history, which should be addressed uh, with an awareness of the issues. This naturally requires extending research on the post-war period to the 60s and 70s and beyond and this is happening already. Even more critical will be the creation of a world history narrative and that connects the 60s as a paradigm to the pre-war period and then to the 21st century before and after that period. In my own research, for example, I would like to consider collectivism and the transition of exhibitions with a complete historical framework and present it with critical mind not only for Japan but also for the periphery as well as modernism and her contemporary art as a whole. Uh, thirdly, uh, there are aspects uh, that require structural efforts. Needless to say, the continuation of the Trinity is necessary, but what is currently most critical is the training of the next generation of researchers and curators. To think more concretely, uh, one needs to focus on issues on the Japanese side. Uh, first, uh, to participate in the Trinity strategy in an impactful way. Uh, this includes recognizing the role of art history, which is not yet widely understood in Japan, and making people aware of the difference between art history and art criticism. A second, uh, to share the macro or the big picture uh, view of history that is being debated in world art history. A third, uh, there is support for the development of next generation that can only come from Japan. And one of the most urgent issues uh, is the development of practical Japanese language skills. Related to this, the question of translation comes up, which is uh, Dr. Moroti's uh, topic. First, uh, there are two directions in art history research. While there are those outside Outside Japan, uh, outside the Japanese specialty, who work uh, from a gl broad uh, global perspective, there is also a need for specialists who delve uh, deeply into local knowledge. In order uh, for Japan to secure a fixed position in world art history, both global and local directions are necessary. In this case, translation is useful for broadening the base of interest, but it is not necessarily beneficial for the language training of specialists. This is because it is necessary to also read what has not been translated in order to deepen one's research. In addition, the existence of researchers who can deepen local area studies and link them to global proposals is indispensable to tackle world art history from the periphery in a bottom-up manner. Is there any support that can be provided from the Japanese side for this latter? Uh, here is my recommendation to the art uh, platform. I would like you to think of translating dynamically in two directions, broad and deep. What is especially needed is uh, practical support for second languages, not only for static uh, translation projects, but also for dynamic development of these projects. This is uh, not a, a problem uh, abroad. Uh, this is more an issue within Japan. If uh, Japanese uh, researchers improve their English reading and writing or presentation skills, they will be able to understand the macro results overseas, leading to more active research and presentation. In addition, research who are not natives of Japan will deepen their research investigations by improving their ability to read and understand materials. Currently, interest and motivation in learning Japanese is lower than that for Chinese and Korean in the United States. Language skills are essential for deepening art history research, but research level language skills are not something that can be taught in language schools, but require real world learning opportunities. Oh, for example, just being able to read text and its translation side by side on art platform will create the depth that is needed for readers of both English and Japanese. That is how I see it. Uh, there's still much more I would like to discuss, uh, but I will end for now. Thank you very much for your uh, attention.
Thank you very much indeed, Tommy san You now have to call upon Associate Professor William Marotti of the University of California, Los Angeles. He is an expert, a specialist in everyday life and cultural historical issues, and teaches uh, modern Japanese history. He is also chair of the East Asian Studies of the MA Interdepartmental Degree Program, and also director of the Japanese Arts and Globalization Multi Campus Research Group. From Duke University Press in 2013, he published Money, Trains, and Guillotines Art and Revolution in 1960s Japan. Currently, he is working on the art of revolution politics and aesthetic disruption in 1960s Japan. Professor Marotti, please. Hi, I'm William Marotti. I teach history at UCLA and I'm the chair of the Interdepartmental Master's Program in East Asian Studies. I also direct the multi-campus research group, Japanese Arts and Globalizations. It's my pleasure to be speaking to you today. I'll also be participating live in the discussion portion of this event, uh, assuming that my coffee re remains effective. So today I'd like to speak about my experience working on teaching, preserving, and occasionally translating art from Japan. I'd like to speak about what's involved in that and about its importance. I'll have a bit to say about the value of conversations coming out of art about the importance of hearing from missing interlocutors in these conversations, and about the vital importance of translation and preservation alike. And throughout, I'd like to ask us all to think about how the value of art as a vital part of the world is absolutely dependent on it not being reduced to nationalized visions of culture. So I'm a historian, uh, one that specializes in cultural history, which is decidedly not bunkashi, Kulturaru uh, shi is a bit closer to the mark. Culture in this framework is not about cultures, plural, and especially not nation-dependent or organicist ideas of national culture, but rather it's about the dimension of people's lives involved with meaning-making and perception. So this sense of culture is about thinking about how people perceive and interpret and understand the world in different ways. I'm especially interested in con contention and creativity because although everybody has a world, we all have different ones, even or especially within nation states. People within communities differ in how they see the world and argue constantly about what is happening, about how they got to the present. They argue about the meaning of the past in the present. They present different and contending visions of connection and community and they discover potentials and possibilities in the course of these disagreements. As an essential vibrant part of culture, artists maintain a dialogue with the world, reflecting their own perspectives, but more to the point, attending to phenomena through the medium of art itself. Through art, we create the possibility of seeing things differently, separate from anyone's intention or expectation, and being moved by that new perception. To quote artist Nakajima Yoshio, Art is the next possibility. This is equally true of previous art, recent and old alike, near and far. Any art can show us different perspectives and point to potentials that can be meaningfully examined here and now. It can speak to us in new ways in our current moment. But these possibilities depend on that art being present and available. The play of perceptions and forms in art often runs contrary to the wishes of those invested in the way things are. And that's why there's a long history the world over of attacks on art and expression. And while such disturbances are often greeted with hostility, they represent the living part of culture, of people and their imaginations. Without it, we get frozen, museumified, zombie-like culture and conformism, or equally bad, a commodified, brand-dominated culture that just caters to expectations. So with all of that in mind, my talk today is about the potentials of the astonishing diversity of art in Japan and the possibilities opened up by translation projects, and conversely, the diminishment of these possibilities by poor preservation efforts and reductive nationalist framings. So let me begin with an example. I have a long engagement with the history and practice of Butoh. Butoh has been called 
modern Japanese theater's greatest legacy to the world. The name describes an amazingly rich, diverse, and engaging set of performances and legacies with deep and productive connections to a wide range of other art forms. Years ago, I took part in a seminar in Beijing part of a week-long exchange between Buto and contemporary dance practitioners and scholars and dancers in China. The project involved the provocation of, of workshops offering dance exchanges, along with interpretive talks on dance history. I gave a talk discussing Buto's origins in the context of avant-garde art in the 1960s. The Chinese audience was especially interested in the ways that this art explored problematic aspects of the economic expansion at a moment when the government was pushing economic progress as the grounds for governmental legitimacy. They found the implicit historical comparison to be highly instructive in their own situation. But afterwards, a young ballet student asked me if I thought that such experimental arts did damage to society. Now, this was a set official phrase often uttered by government members as an accusation against non-official art and actions. And my response was that, yes, they damaged society. And that was a good thing. I explained that what I meant was that because they were part of a living creative practice, they addressed things in the world. Living art and performance reworked frozen, broken parts to point to different possibilities. It was the live, thriving part of culture. My clear implication was that if what we call society was seen in opposition to that vitality, it meant a defense of dead forms against the living. And the student looked relieved. Novelist James Baldwin put it a different way, he said, now it is true that the nature of society is to create among its citizens an illusion of safety but it is also absolutely true that the safety is always necessarily an illusion. Artists are here to disturb the peace. They have to disturb the peace, otherwise chaos. And Baldwin explains how Mark makes connections, he continues. If you can examine and face your life, you can discover the terms with which you are connected to other lives, and they can discover them too, the terms with which they're connected to other people. This has happened to every one of us, I'm sure. You read something which you thought only happened to you, and you discovered it happened 100 years ago to Dostoevsky. This is a very great liberation for the suffering, struggling person who always thinks that they're alone. This is why art is important. Art would not be important if life were not important, and life is important. So art is vital. Current art and old art alike, art here, art from far away, all of it makes for possibilities and connections on a human scale and against all the ways that people can be treated as less than full humans. It's about living and thriving in the world. All art can speak to us in unexpected ways and move us in ways we don't anticipate. It's an essential part of the human experience. It's about different perspectives and about possibilities from unexpected exchanges. Art is an engagement with the world, however local and specific it might seem in the moment of its creation. And art that arises in one moment, in one place, can prove meaningful and important in another. Let me stay with Butoh for a moment. Butoh is the name for a dance genre arising out of an experimental set of pathbreaking performances in the late 50s and, and 1960s. And it was part of an extraordinary cultural productivity in an avant-garde scene, one that saw the transformation and combination of virtually every form of creative endeavor, from the traditional to the technological. Now, I've written on this quite a bit and have argued that the scene was both one of remarkable, distinctive invention and simultaneously part of a worldwide global phenomenon of transformative approaches to art and politics alike. Both within local scenes and across the globe, it demonstrated a wide diversity of approaches and solidarities, of distinctions and of mutual recognitions near and far. I would argue that this creative explosion was the most important, complex, and enduring part of the global 60s. Now, as but a single element in this, Butoh has proven to have remarkable power 
in a wide variety of contexts. As critic and scholar Kuniyoshi Kazuko has argued, Buto is not only performance, but also the embodiment of one of the most precise critical spirits in the history of the consciousness of the body, with the strength of thought, which impinges deeply on the history of the human spirit, the imprint left by the potent ideas of Ichigata Tatsumi. Buto's power to uncover conventions and contradictions and to bring it to the level of the body, an unconventional, even anti-conventional expression, has been demonstrated all over the world. As Buto practitioner Katsuda Khan said at that conference in Beijing, quote, Buto shows something that can't be identified on stage, but if the audience keeps watching, gradually they give up thinking about the meaning and can interpret their own stories. I'd, I'd agree with this. I think that it's in fact the possibility with any sort of inventive and transformative art, that power is thus wrapped in ambivalence. It can be an invitation to perceive things differently, or it can be an invitation to interpret that strangeness back into the confines of familiar categories. Now, here's, here's what critic Theodore Adorno had to say about interpreting surrealist works, for, for example. So what is deadly about the interpretation of art, moreover, even philosophically responsible interpretation, is that in the process of conceptualization, it's forced to express what is strange and surprising in terms of what is already familiar and thereby to explain away the only thing that would need explanation. So let me talk a bit about encounters and about translation as a way of thinking about the value of art. In fact, my entire career in working on Japanese art, culture, and history comes out of encounters with that art and literature. Literary works and translation that I read in college and on my own first sparked my interest. But encounters with Buto were really pivotal. I saw Sankai Juku perform back in the mid 80s, back when their aesthetic approach still contained a bit of the wildness and provocation of Daidaka Khan. Later, a chance perusal of a Buto photo book early in my graduate career drew my attention to the simultaneous political and cultural foment of the 1960s in Japan and suggested a direction for my subsequent research, thinking about the connections and differences and overlaps in what we think of as art and politics. Both of these productive encounters came from seeing Buto as a provocation, not as exotica, but as something complex, far from simple, and offering a window into something other than the usual conversations and narratives. Following that initial impulse over two decades, I published a book that centers art and performance in the 1960s in order to reframe post-war history in a productively different way. Now, my point in relating this is not so much to share my own intellectual biography, but rather to note that from personal experience, I have an appreciation of the ways in which Buto and art can lead to the unexpected. Now, let me tell you about a related and uncanny translation experience. Uh, years ago, when I was a Kenkyusei at Todai, I was asked to contribute a, a piece to Shia Daatsu on Buto scholarship and interpretation. And I, I wrote a draft in English and received a translation back. And, it was full of serious errors. So I got together with the editor and we went over it line by line in Japanese over a course of many, many hours. In the process, I, al I also did an extensive number of extemporaneous rewrites and additions in Japanese. Uh, so extensive, in fact, that there was effectively no original English text in the end. Uh, the essay, Buto no Mondai Sei to Honshi Shugi no Wana, was published in 1997. Now, in that article, I criticized the prevalent essentialism of interpretations that saw Buto as merely an authentic expression of the innate characteristics of the Japanese body. It was, in my mind, a, a bizarre and sad fate that a dance born of astonishingly original experimentalism and wide-ranging engagement with art and performance across the ages and brilliantly in innovative invention might have all of that erased in favor of some sort of empty reassurance about unchanging national body, bodily identity, a kind of so-called, you know, Zen Kindai Dozok Teki Shintai. What was a provocative, precise art form became in the hands of such critics, simply evidence of eternal unchanging physical identity. In other words, the prevailing nationalist interpretation focused on the idea of a Nihon Kaiki, took something creative and critical and made it dull. 
by assuming its content as identity, it encouraged viewers to complacency, to simply see what they already believed and not to notice the performance in front of them. It also assumed a total separation between an authentic national culture and a Western other, an argument that erased the deep complexities of the dance form's engagement with art, performance, and history, both within and beyond Japan. That left performers frustrated with their actual work ignored, and its possibilities and diversity reduced to a single meaning, made in Japan. My essay generated a fair amount of controversy at the time, and I was invited out to elaborate on it with a, in a symposium with uh, Kuniyoshi Kazuko, Yoshida Yoshie, and Uno Kunichi, Kunichi at the 50th annual uh, Nihon Buyogakkai meeting in 2000. I was also pleased subsequently to find younger scholars in Japan beginning to cite the piece to give themselves support for their own critical interpretations with Buto. It also proved of interest and more than interest to a number of Buto practitioners. Uh, nearby to Wasada, there exists Cafe Shai, run by Morobushi Ko's former manager, Watanabe Kimiko, and preserving his, his library and archive. And visiting in 2016, among the many volumes that Murobushi had, had edited carefully, uh, I was happy to find uh, my article in Shiata Arts full of circles and underlines and marks of emphasis. And I was really pleased that it meant something to him because uh, Murobushi is one of the performers who've been instrumental in fostering the vibrant Buto scene in Mexico. I, I should also mention uh, Nakajima Natsu. Um, all that, all that to the side, a few years ago, some friends were editing a massive compendium of translations and essays on Buto, and they asked me to provide a translation of my 1997 article, and I found myself in the uncanny position of having to translate myself from Japanese to English. It was an experience that drew, drew, drove home a point that translators have long understood, that the term translation covers over the reality that you're actually creating something new, something that extends the life and scope of a work into another linguistic domain. And it's performing a creative interpretive act. In this case, it was a kind of double or even triple interpretation, a critical reinterpretation of Bhutto and Bhutto scholarship, an interpretation of my own words, some translated from an original text and others written directly in Japanese. Now that big book on Bhutto, was produced by Rutledge as part of an explosion of interest in this and related forms of art and performance from Japan, interest worldwide. Or rather, publications in English and other languages are beginning to do justice to its worldwide importance, documenting the diversity of approaches within its past and present. It's also the case that investigations in the arts have begun to think more seriously about the global nature of art and begun to consider decolonizing approaches to that art. The conversations are an opportunity, and I'm delighted that Art Platform Japan has committed to the urgently necessary work of translation to help expand that conversation. Now, I'm especially pleased to be part of the work making Kuroda Daiji's book available in English. Uh, this book is precisely uh, Anarchy of the Body Undercurrents of Performance Art in the 1960s Japan, is precisely the kind of richly detailed, careful work that is the greatest potential to have an explosive, extensive impact. Kuroda's years of researching through the faintest traces of this art and performance have been essential reading and will soon become available to a much wider, wider re readership. I'd especially like to draw attention to Kuroda's precise details and fidelity to the documentary record for the simple reason that it has produced the broadest and most detailed picture possible for this art and performance, even and especially when that work strains against commonplace categories of understanding. So I would argue in favor of a few points. First, often the most vital and important forms of creative activity go beyond conventional categories and practices. And it's that lack of fit with standard thinking itself that is the greatest strength. In the case of avant-gardism in the 1960s, much of this work doesn't get recognized as art or is interpreted in reference to the term anti-art, non-art. And that lack of fit or that excess is in fact the very thing that needs discussing. Now, you give lots of examples of this, but perhaps I can just mention a book I'm co-writing on artist Nakajima Yoshio. Someone featured a bit within Kuroda's work and, and very few other places. 
Nakajima's storied career has traversed an astonishing range of lo locations, scenes, and movements, and media and performance modes in ways that challenge our notions of the role, place, and possibilities of art. They also exemplify a missing interlocutor in these conversations about global art. So Nakajima is involved in late 1950s happenings on stri streets and trains in Tokyo and in front of moving trains. He travels from Japan to Italy by hitchhiking in 1964 and commences a career as an art missionary in Europe. He's also expelled from several countries in the process. But he's involved in performances inaugurating the Magic Center in Spooey Square in Amsterdam, which helped to catalyze the provost for whom he becomes both emblem and international advocate. And he's involved with alternative documenta and with the Bauhaus Situation East. And his work ranges across performance, conceptual, sculptural, and figurative art. And he also inaugurates the International Ube Bodas Symposium in Sweden, the longest outdoor art festival in Swedish history. And the paradox of Nakajima's work is that despite its apparent exemplification of art's potential to move and to transform, it's largely fallen out of accounts in which its impact might be justifiably featured. So in this book, uh, I'm working in collaboration with researchers in Japan and Europe to put his work back into the conversations where it rightly belongs. And our approach has been to proceed from close examinations of Nakajima's productivity and complex connections to find an avenue out of frameworks that have hitherto excluded this activity. And with it, a crucial dimension of the interrelations of art and politics in the 60s and beyond. Artistic practices like Nakajima's repeatedly exceeded normative categories. Such transgressions could in turn yield new perceptions and understandings of both art and politics, even as they provoked puzzlement and non-recognition within conventional frameworks. As an example, his unfathomable rituals in the Netherlands and Belgium broke ground as new forms of performance, but also they helped to make subsequent activist practices, such as those of the provost, both thinkable and recognizable as politics. Nakajima's work thus provides a compelling case for evaluating approaches to these transformations of art and politics and to their specific interrelation. His peripatetic practices are exemplary in their nonconformity and demonstrate the inadequacy of notions of specificity that would oppose an authentic local or national frame to an inauthentic transnational one. It's also the case that such work manifests a key dimension of the 60s as a global event, the interrelation between eventfulness and transformation of categories of practice and understanding. Conversely, art and performance, such as Nakajima's, requires such insights in order to be adequately grasped, both for itself and as a part of what made this moment global. Despite or because of their imperfect intelligibility, this art allowed others to see and experience the world differently. And paying attention to it reveals the potential of such art and politics to emerge at any time, unpredictably beyond intention or design. So if, if we take up this one example of overlooked but exemplary work from the 1960s, and if I can return again to Kuroda Daiji's work in translation, Kuroda's work has the potential to really deepen understandings of this incredible diversity of work within and connected to Japan. It will allow for such work to be recognized within global frames in its simultaneous distinctiveness and connection with this moment. And it will do so in ways that we can't predict and which will likely change over time with different aspects becoming important to different writers and within different circumstances. The translation will bring it into all these conversations from which it had been previously absent much in the same way that Kuroda's book originally made a case for the importance of these practices against a domestic art history that had given them insufficient attention. It's on this point that I'd like to conclude. It was recently reported that 47% of United States museums focus on just the top 4% of contemporary artists. Galleries do better, but regardless, we have a situation in which name brands predominate, which in where viewership is effectively restricted. Simply put, art's possibilities depend on our ability to encounter it. It's also the case that we can't predict what sort of art might speak to us at a given time. Marcel Duchamp's work was re rediscovered and enjoyed a transformative afterlife in the 1960s, for example. And again, to take the example of the 1960s, as Kuroda's work makes clear, there's an incredible range of creative work, 
Much of it left little or no traces. Others did, but were never picked up in either art circles or the popular or underground presses. Still others were noticed, but faded with the following moment, somehow not connecting with that subsequent context. And plenty of it didn't look like art at all as currently recognized. It wasn't simple and it wasn't safe and it wasn't tidy. Taken together, however, it represents an incredible flourishing of creativity that speaks to its moment and every part of it has the potential always to speak to our present. But again, that depends on our ability to encounter it. Translation makes work more widely available for such encounters, but unfortunately, lack of preservation creates a much more extensive movement in the other direction. With space at a premium, an aging population, and insufficient public support, every day irreplaceable works, traces, texts, photos, and the like go to the incinerators. Every day. Some of it is work that might well have spoken eloquently to us, a forgotten art full of potential for celebration and wonder. But as the ecologists tell us, extinction is forever. If all we preserve for the future is a narrow set of works and documents from recognizable brands, we will all be the worse for it. We need to do better. A few years ago, I helped with efforts to preserve the archive of critic Yoshida Yoshie. Despite urgent entreaties, there was simply no reliable place in Japan willing to accept the collection. And so with the blessing of his family, we did the extraordinary step of shipping the collection to UCLA, where our preservation team carefully went through everything and preserved it archivally. The exhibition we held in conjunction with the symposium on his life and work revealed the breadth and importance and wisdom of this critic and event orchestrator. His house was demolished months later. Conversely, when my then student, Kelly McCormick, went to visit Tokiwa Toyoko, the groundbreaking photographer, she was then in hospice and her family was delighted to see Kelly, but sadly reported that the entirety of Tokiwa's decades and decades of photographs and documents had been destroyed when she went to the care facility. A thousand instances like this are constantly happening. And I really do hope that at the same time that there's investment in translation, this really important work, there might also be a more, much more robust effort to rescue this imperiled art for all our futures. Thank you for listening. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Professor Marotti. Uh, Mr. Mi uh, spoke about uh, the uh, the uh, post-war uh, art and how uh, we can uh, then engage uh, the academia uh, market uh, and uh, the uh, museum uh, to uh, find a place uh, for the, such uh, post-war and uh, contemporary art uh, in its history. And she has also made some uh, recommendations as to what can be done with regard to translation of uh, these uh, academic works. And uh, Professor Marotti uh, has uh, spoken uh, about uh, the uh, the dialogue uh, that uh, goes uh, beyond uh, the uh, languages, and he's also uh, then uh, spoke about his uh, uh, his experience uh, in engaging in uh, translations. Also uh, uh, spoke about the possibilities uh, that uh, translations uh, can bring about uh, to these studies. Uh, we will now have a panel uh, session. We have the two uh, previous speakers, uh, Mr. Mi and Mr. Professor Marotti. In in addition to that, we have members from the Translation Project Selection Committee, um, uh, Izumi in Nakajima, uh, Hiroki Yamamoto, and Hanasuko Odate. And we also have Herena Okubo from the Art Platform uh, Secretariat. And I am uh, Kazi, Kenji Kazuya, and I will be acting as moderator as well as a panelist. And uh, Nakajima-san uh, is uh, from the uh, Osaka uh, University, and he is uh, conducting his uh, uh, research on uh, modern uh, art. And uh, he is also uh, has uh, published uh, various um, uh, volumes, and he has received the 42nd uh, Santori uh, Academic Award. And um, so, uh, Yamamoto uh, is a lecturer at the Department of Fine Art, uh, Kanazawa uh, College of Art. 
Hart. And uh, he's also a publisher of several works. And Ms. Okubo is a translator, and uh, he has her work with artists, uh, museums, and she has uh, penned several uh, translations uh, for these institutions. So we would uh, now uh, like to start this uh, panel of discussions. And we already heard from the three speakers. So uh, for the other members, uh, perhaps you would like to uh, voice your comments, uh, having listened to the three speakers. Yamamoto-san, oh, or can we start with Yamamoto-san? Yes, I understand that we have only a little, little time, so, and I shouldn't be speaking too quickly because it will be difficult for the translator. And thank you very much uh, for the, the, the presentations. Uh, uh, they were all wonderful her presentations. Uh, in Ms. Tomi's uh, presentation, uh, she is all about the various uh, layers uh, that are necessary, and that for that uh, she explained her, her concept or uh, her theory of the uh, Trinity. And I think uh, she has spoken uh, based on the experience that she has had, and her uh, professor uh, Moroti has talked about Tokyo and the and I think uh, that uh, the archives that these artists this has had, uh, had not been handed on to anybody else. And I understand uh, that there is a difficulty of maintaining the legacy of the uh, works of art. And now, uh, I think it is uh, the museum and the market, or the interplay between the museum and interplay, uh, where I have, do also recognize that there is not sufficient uh, interplay between uh, them. I do hope that we'll be able to see a network uh, being created uh, created. And I think uh, Tomisan also mentioned uh, the uh, importance of having uh, that interplay. And I hope that we'll be able to create some sort of a, a platform uh, on which uh, we'll be able to discuss uh, these matters. And the fact that this uh, project is already mentioned uh, as an art platform, I think that will pave the way for this. And there are two questions that I'd like to uh, ask of uh, Tomisan. Uh, she mentioned that we have to go broadly and also deep Deeply. That means uh, once we do these uh, translation projects, that's not the end, but we have to go even beyond that. And Odatisan also mentioned that what it is that we need to do to continue our efforts. And it's very important that we are able to go broadly as well as deeply. And so my question is, uh, what is uh, Ms. Tomi's uh, thoughts on how we can expand uh, these uh, efforts uh, broadly and deeply? And uh, uh, Professor Marotti here talked about the decolonization uh, or the approach of her decolonialization. And I myself have also been involved in her similar ideas. And I was uh, very surprised that uh, you would mention that as part of this discussion on translation. And from the experience that uh, Professor Marotti has had, uh, what are some of the issues of her translation uh, that you have identified uh, with re regard to the decolonialization? And how does that involve the art platform project? So these are the two questions I'd like to uh, then ask. Oh, should we go on to uh, Nakajima-san and ask for her uh, comment? Oh, thank you, uh, Professor Marotti and Ms. Tomi. Uh, thank you uh, for a very interesting uh, uh, presentations. And I know that both of you are uh, deeply involved uh, in her translations and the vast amount of knowledge and experience that uh, you have in these areas. I hope that we'll be able to uh, uh, utilize uh, some of your uh, thoughts and experiences. And having listened to the two of you, uh, we both mentioned that uh, there is a crisis that we are finding in the area of uh, art uh, research. And I think uh, that led uh, to this project of translation uh, being initiated. Uh, but I think we can also regard this as a good opportunity uh, to uh, save or uh, to uh, counter that feeling of crisis that you uh, harbor. Um, uh, Tomi-san, uh, you said uh, that uh, in translation, there is one way of uh, sharing uh, this uh, macro uh, experience or having uh, intervening in that uh, macro experience. When we look at art history in Japan, 
uh, we have had a, a chance of uh, making this uh, more broad and uh, general uh, uh, concept. I myself uh, had been studying, uh, especially on the uh, female artists or feminism, and uh, I am uh, trying to see how uh, that uh, will continue uh, will, uh, relate uh, to other uh, contexts. When we look at feminism, uh, is there any historical tie between the Western uh, idea of feminism and that of the uh, Japanese feminism? And I was wondering whether the trans translation efforts will help in understanding of these uh, relationships. And uh, there are certain things uh, which had not, uh, which had been uh, suppressed in a view of the history, uh, which uh, through translation uh, could become uh, more visible, or it could also be go it be lost in her translation at the same time. Uh, so I was uh, wondering whether you have any thoughts on that, uh, anyone, either one of you. And Okubo-san, I understand uh, uh, there will be uh, some questions directed to you with regard to translation, uh, so maybe we can hold, you can hold your comments up to that point when we do handle all the uh, questions. So uh, may I ask uh, Tomi-san or uh, Professor Morotti uh, to respond to uh, some of the questions, uh, if you would like to unmute. Uh, oh, oh, thank you, Yamamoto-san, Nakajima-san. And very important questions. Well, uh, Yamamoto-san uh, spoke about the depth and the broadness, uh, broad and deep. Uh, uh, in order uh, for the uh, concept to take uh, root, uh, it's important that what has been translated uh, be widely utilized and used. So uh, immediately I can think of uh, something uh, like an Asian uh, contemporary art uh, course uh, where some of these uh, translations could be used as uh, perhaps a textbook or aid uh, to understanding of the research. Uh, from the 1960s uh, through to 2010s, uh, the text had been selected to cover a very lo long period. Tsumi Seiji's her text was uh, from 1975. And um, I wonder how it can be used. It could be used uh, for the history of art as well as history of culture. And I think uh, this uh, needs to be used uh, for uh, teaching or as teaching material. Uh, but to me, so text alone will not be sufficient. And so it's possible that you can start with uh, some of these uh, volumes uh, which are selected. And then uh, you could expand on them in uh, uh, putting together a curriculum curriculum uh, for these studies. And so I think you need to uh, publicize the fact or disseminate the fact uh, that such uh, translations exist. And with her books or uh, with anthologies, uh, you do have them in the physical uh, format, so it's easier uh, to uh, take them in your hands. However, uh, once it is uh, uh, shared on over the inter internet, while well, they are readily accessible, um, perhaps I will not really reach out uh, to look for uh, such uh, volumes. And we are uh, talking about crisis, but of course, in a positive manner, you can capture that as a good opportunity. And uh, I think. Uh, uh, the, the lack of the next generation researchers um, is uh, something that we find. Of course, there are uh, certain researchers that there may not be uh, enough Japanese researchers, but we've also uh, found uh, that uh, there's an increasing number of Asian researchers looking at uh, Japanese uh, postmodern uh, art. So uh, that is uh, true. And uh, for that, uh, there is that issue of language uh, abilities or uh, translation uh, that might uh, be uh, something that is uh, worth uh, taking up. Uh, Professor Marotti, I'll speak in English if possible. Um, so thank thank you both for your, for your questions. And I, I think maybe I'll respond to 
both of them together a bit um, uh, through through Yamamoto San's uh, uh, teeing up with the question of decolonization. Uh, and you know, this is talking about uh, a broad phenomenon within art history uh, that really recognizes many more places in the world being absolutely up to date and participating in worldwide transformations in art and as part of the world. We're all on the same planet at the same time. And you know, this is this is a reality over which all sorts of forms of domination and racism and all kinds of things uh, devalue certain members of that world. And and so part of the role of the important role of, of translation is to make people who are already interested in these conversations and interested in including more of the world in thinking about art um, are going to be, you know, surprised and shocked and, and fascinated by how rich and how incredible uh, the, the stuff going on within the boundaries of Japan is and how connected it is to the world. And and so there's this there's this reality that needs recognition as equal participants in art on the planet and all the transformations that are going on. Um, but there's also this question, and and again to think about you know Kiki and Kikai, the, there's 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 always this this risk too that you know in in going for some voices we miss others, and you know particularly thinking about like feminist voices. Uh, I recall a, a conversation in Shizuoka uh, when I went to see the, the 1968 exhibition there and, uh, and the curator there talked about her frustration trying to get more women involved in, in this, actually I actually have the catalog here, more women involved in this presentation and, and feeling like it, it, was, it was a little thin. Um, I encouraged her very strongly to, to think about doing a 1970s show that could really showcase a lot of women. Um, but to do that, you need the materials. And if there's bad preservation, it's a loss. And I took note on the Art Platform Japan website that among the recent translations, to, to point in another direction, you have some, some great works talking about talking about conversations uh, of, of feminism in Japanese art. You also have uh, a really rarity, the Kishimoto Sayako uh, uh, piece from, from when she's, she's running as a candidate. And, you know, Akiyama Yutokutai, she just had a retrospective at Gallery 58. And, uh, you know, of course, his mayoral run is very famous and important. But, you know, Kishimoto especially had you know, she did a lot of kind of performance work and her, her works were very poorly collected, I think. And, and just to have that voice in there is, is really important, I think. And it's edgy and it's fun and I love it. And I, I just wanted to, to say bravo for including that. So thank you. Thank you. Absolutely. Um, Post-war art. While introducing what is considered to be important, up to now, there's been the artists and the documents, the material which has been overlooked or passed over. We're trying to rectify that. We're also trying to bring them into the conversation. All that is done. Um, after listening to the two presentations from Tomisa Marotti-san, it really hits home, really. Um, unlike you, I am more of the supporting secretariat side for the Trinity. Showing on itself isn't enough. Discourse itself is not enough. It's something which I'm really made aware of day by day every single day, in fact. Also, archiving, as uh, Professor Marotti said, I mean, I have it in front of my eyes. 
and I tend to be completely at loss to what to do. Artists, of course, want to have advice about what to do and how to preserve it. We need to have more systematic and systemic collection and documentation. We also need to do that as a total approach for translation, and also for the entire endeavor for nations and also for the entire Asian region. It's something that I'm really made aware of again. Thank you. Thank you. Um, it's a translation project that we're looking at in this symposium, which um, these members are, who are participating are doing. As Tommy San has just pointed out, it also ties in with the art market, also with museums, scholarship. And as uh, Maroti San and all that San have mentioned, archives are cru that's another issue. All these need to be linked together organically, and they need to be acting in tandem together. Also, Tommy San mentioned that Simiseichi's Seiji's, I think it was on the opening of the Saison Museum. Um, there needs to be more additional explanation. I have to confess, it's only partial. It's not complete yet. We're going to be adding to it. We can intend to provide background and context about the meaning. Uh, for example, Tsumi-san, where the idea of the Jidai no Konkyoti it's um, it's really a Marxist term that is being used there in the Japanese original. And Tsumi-san was a Marxist in his youth. So it really is um, pregnant with meaning. And we do feel there's need to be able to give the triggers and all those hooks that were to provide a greater and richer context and possibilities. Also, Kitada Noriaki-san. Kitada Noriaki has been connected, has been working on um, the translation history, the history of translation in art. And once we get that into interconnectors, then I think it's going to be possible to have cross-references and contextualization. If I may, Translation, if there is a Japanese text which is being translated into English, that is how you're probably using the word honyaku, text translation. My feeling, my sense is that looking at the English Anglosphere, talking about post-war Japanese art is Art translation itself. Professor Barotti spoke about how translation is a new creation when he was retranslating his text that he had actually written in English in the original. And I don't know whether it's possible to talk about the new trans a new creation, but when you have a face of the person you're conversing with and you have the opportunity to work that you do when you interact with somebody looking face to face and you need to have translation. The idea where you have the three pronged process and I've also been able to take part in the translation process so I would assume and I guess that there's been this multi-layered and very painstaking process but it's because it was about making it understandable and communicable. So it was not just replacing a term in Japanese with into English. It needed a process of making it understandable and relatable. So you needed all that more additional work. So the background, the context about how to communicate what is being said here. So that totality is what we talk about when we talk about translation. It's not simply word on word translation. Thank you. Uh, that's a very important point, I think. May I? <laughs> so what, what I meant, what I meant by a, a, a translation creating something new is is not not to, you know, travesty someone else's words. Uh, of course, it's to communicate as best as we possibly can the the original work, but. 
but that's always a new creation. And it, there's changes in language. And there's also, you know, e even when, you know, I, I was translating myself, but, you know, in 2018 from 1997, I'm not the same person, I've got a big white beard. And, and there's always, there's always transformations involved with that. Uh, especially with Art Project Japan, where we've got these really excellent notes that are that are in the margins too. That my point was is that these translations are not just you know bringing things over; they're making them live in a new context too. So it's 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 a it's a continuation. It's it's a transplanting. It's it's something that can thrive and and go forward. That's what I meant. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, that is a uh, welcoming words uh, that uh, for our project, and we're supposed to end at 1:30, and I think we just have one or two minutes uh, remaining. So, if I may just move on to some of the questions uh, that have been uh, sent in, and unfortunately, I am not going to be able to uh, take up all the questions uh, which had been sent in. I think uh, there were some uh, questions with regard to translation, so I would like to see if we could uh, take one or two of these questions. And something that was uh, discussed today, why does it have to be uh, translated into English or a translation from, Asia, uh, from English? Why is it that we're not talking about languages in the Asian regions? Or uh, do you uh, think uh, that there's also an area for translating into other languages, uh, or for Chinese, for example, uh, because uh, there's uh, the research in the uh, the Asian or East Asian regions uh, are um, needed. So Yamamoto-san, would you like to respond to that? And uh, yes, uh, I am specializing in East Asia, and I have written books uh, with regard to that topic. And uh, currently, um, this uh, uh, I'm not uh, targeting only uh, the English uh, speakers, uh, but because English is uh, used as a common uh, language, and anyone uh, who is uh, looking into uh, material on uh, Japanese art, uh, the English is uh, the most widely uh, spoken language, and therefore I believe that is the first step uh, to translate into English. But it is an important point that you have pointed out. And for those of you who are studying uh, East Asian uh, culture, I'm happy to uh, receive such a question. And especially on uh, in Japan, or if you're looking at Japan as part of East Asia, uh, then I think uh, there are certain areas which also need to be translated into other languages. And uh, there are also some uh, questions uh, with regard to translation, and I'd like to direct that to uh, Ms. Okubo. For example, how do you improve the uh, quality of the translations of translators? And uh, I think uh, we may already have uh, answered that question. Uh, to a certain extent. And why is it that there are so many errors and mistakes in translation? And uh, today uh, we talk about gentai, uh, gentai. Uh, and we use the word contemporary uh, to translate from uh, 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 Gendai. And there are also some of our conceptions like uh, Desan and Krokis, uh, which are in the Japanese uh, language. And so how do you handle those expressions, uh, which may not be in English or Japanese? Thank you very much for that question. Uh, I'd like to respond to that question about the quality of translation first. And that is to say, uh, as Odat Desan mentioned, in our project, we have the three-stage process of translating and then cross-checking and proofreading. These are the three stages uh, that a translation goes through. That means that we try to have involvement as many people as possible uh, so that uh, there uh, uh, views or their uh, 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 their talent uh, could be uh, used uh, for the purpose of translation, because how someone who has written 
a, a work, a research work. Uh, having spent uh, so much work on that, it is going to be very difficult uh, to try to transplant that into another language. And we are hoping that we'll be able to achieve the necessary quality by having a teamwork of uh, people. And at the same time, uh, uh, improving the quality, I think uh, this network also allows the chance to get as much feedback as possible. And uh, translation is something that you can then uh, gain experience and then improve uh, on doing that. So that uh, having inputs or feedback from as many people as possible, uh, the translator will also be able to improve on uh, his or her uh, skills. And as to uh, expression like a uh, gendai uh, art uh, in Japan, I think you can refer to the style guide uh, that had been prepared. And uh, if it's a, a Japanese a word, we can then accompany that uh, by uh, Japanese as it is in italic. And we also try to have uh, some uh, footnotes, uh, for example, uh, which will uh, further uh, explain or uh, supplement uh, the uh, translated uh, word uh, for a better understanding. I'm sorry to have gone uh, very quickly uh, through uh, my uh, responses, uh, but I think what we are trying to do is to uh, maintain or retain uh, some of the uh, original language expressions and try to uh, complement that uh, by uh, translation. And the last question, activities that the art world doesn't really value, such as the regional art festivals to hold gated like then, um, I'll just respond to that. It's not about just focusing on the artists who are recognized today and just translating texts which are connected to that. It's really a process of the participants in this project, reading and re-reading and also reinterpreting and also discovering things in that process and understanding the importance of artists who have not been previously recognized for their importance. Uh, I'd just like to ask if anybody has anything to add at the very end of this symposium. I do apologize for not having enough time for the discussion. Would anybody like to add something at this point before we close and wrap up this meeting? My apologies, um, bad time management. But concerning the translation project, we're able to introduce the overall framework. We've also been able to have the participation of Tomi-san and Maroti-san, who've been involved in translation projects in the United States. And it's really a process of creating the foundations and the basis for value recognition and evaluation in the field of art. And the importance of translation in that context is something that I hope we've been able to share with the audience. And I think we have also been able to understand something what lies ahead of us in the future. And we need to work on this and we need to proceed ahead and forge ahead with this. That's something that I felt very strongly about. So thank you for your participation. Today's interpreters were Kayoko Yokota and Akiko Kobayashi. Thank you. And we'd also like to thank the members of Provincia who've been involved in recording and creating art projects who've been acting as the AV team. And I'd like to thank everybody connected with this project for taking part and making this symposium possible. Once again, thank you for your attention and thank you for your participation and thank you for your interest.